Hey folks, it's Andy. Welcome to Kendo Ramp. Let's get into the questions. Uh, do you use Subudito for any warm-up or strength building exercises? Uh, yeah, I um, I have both like a full-size Subudito, which is like a, a regular Bokken or Bokuto that's um, a lot a lot sort of fatter, um, uh, which I do like to use. I don't use it as regularly as I used to. I used to use it a lot actually when I was, particularly when I was like actively competing. Um, I might crack it out again, actually, now you've brought it up. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I do, I do use them, um, and I do use the, uh, the short one, the, uh, the Foodie Sen as well, that you can see on kendostar.com, um, because it's great for when you're kind of at home or something, and you can't swing a shinai across the low ceilings. So yeah, check that out too. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, recommended. <laughs> uh, next one, what's the difference between the different types of Himo for the Borgo uh, to justify the price difference? Okay, so um, if you buy a Borgo on Kendo Star, you get uh, three choices of Himo. Uh, the first one is the standard Himo. It's just a, um, you know, serviceable, regular type of Himo. Uh, they're perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, they're just cotton, cotton strings. Uh, the Himo, by the way, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, is the strings that tie the Borgo to your body. Um, so, uh, yeah, they're the, the, the sort of standard ones uh, are just a sort of bog standard, no frills, as it were, um, <laughs> Himo. Um, if you go up, up one um, in the sort of price level, um, there's the sort of deluxe eyes on their ones. Now, they're a little bit thicker, so they last a little bit longer, um, but also they're dyed using genuine eyes on there, which is the traditional indigo dye. So they're a nicer colour, um, whereas the basic ones are just sort of dyed navy blue that makes sense uh so yeah the they're a nicer color so they look nicer uh and then the uh the final option which is quite a lot more expensive is the genuine silk ones uh which is as it says it's made of silk instead of cotton um they're really really fancy <laughs> and they're, they're dark navy still um so they don't sort of super jump out as as different they've got a little bit of a sheen to them um, they're really beautiful, actually. They are really, really beautiful, but they're not the sort of thing you want to be sticking on your borger for everyday practice. Um, if you've got like a really high grade borger um, that you only kind of get out for, um, you know, really special occasions uh, or something like that, then maybe you might want to put it on there. Uh, but for your everyday sort of borger, then you're probably better off using um, either the regular one, the standard ones, or the eyes on my ones. I tend to use the eyes on my ones myself because I just prefer the look of them and um, they do have a much nicer colour. Um, okay, so the next ones uh, are actually, these are all from the same person. They were sent to me by email. Um, and some of them are a little bit long, but I'm going to try and cut through them as fast as I can. Um, okay, so first one, why are kata demonstrations a thing at many tournaments? What's the purpose and tradition? Okay, so kata demonstrations happen at lots of tournaments at the beginning. Um, not all. Uh, most tournaments in Japan, Japan do start with a, a kata demonstration. Um, it, it's largely to remind us what kata is. <laughs> um, lots of dojos don't practice much kata, um, so it's to give us a chance to see uh, expert sensei demonstrate, um, demonstrate the kata um, and sort of to remind us how it's supposed to look in a sort of formal setting. Um, so that's the sort of purpose of that. Um, <clears throat> number two, what have your experiences been with collegiate kendo? Um, do you have any advice on how to balance collegiate club needs when some students have picked up kendo as an extra curricular rather than a way of life with students who are super serious about it? So um, I don't have a massive amount of experience with what you call collegiate kendo. I assume you mean by like, like university or college kendo. Um, and yeah, I used to practice at a university club. Um, well, I still do sort of practice with university clubs. Uh, now, but um, and I did I did so in Japan as well as in uh, in England um, as well. So I, I have got a bit of ex experience with that. But in terms of what you need, I've never really experienced where it's been a massive clash between people who are some who are really really serious and some who are really really like uh, just doing it kind of um, for their own enjoyment, as it were. Um, the club itself tends to have an atmosphere of one or the other. Um, but I mean, obviously, everybody's got their own reasons for doing kendo. And it's, I think what the leaders of the club have to really do is kind of take that on board and support the people as much as they can um, sort of in that. And I, I know it's difficult, especially if you've got somebody perhaps who's leading the club that's particularly super serious, for example. And some of the other people maybe are just doing it like as a kind of once a week sort of thing uh, just for a bit of fun. Um, obviously, that's very difficult to balance out. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, that's 
that's that's kind of how it sort of works. So I think the um, you know the the lead, if there's somebody leading, they have to understand that they have to understand that not everybody is the same as they are. Um, now where you're going to get a problem is when you have somebody. Um, and it's quite a common problem. You have somebody that's like, well, I'm not really willing to commit to it like as a complete way of life, um, 100%. Um, but then they're kind of like, well, why aren't, why aren't I improving quicker and stuff like that? And it's, you know, that's, that's when obviously there's a, there's a clash there. People also have to understand that if they're not going to sort of approach it as seriously as perhaps other members, then obviously their progress is going to be uh, kind of, Measured at that pace, shall we say. <laughs> um, okay, next one. Uh, how do you know when to replace a burger? Uh, are the different criteria for cote do tare men? So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's up to you uh, in lots of situations. Most people repair the, uh, not repair, so replace their burger before they necessarily absolutely have to. Um, but, uh, I mean, you need to replace the men when something like... Uh, it depends on what kind of burger you're talking about. You know, if you've got a, a very expensive hand-stitched burger and the ago here, the skidare, um, breaks away from the membuchi um, after years of practice, then it, replacing that men could cost an awful lot of money and it could be more econo economical uh, to have it repaired. Um, but if it's a kind of lower-level men or an entry-level men and that breaks, I mean... Repairing that is a full rebuild, could be a full rebuild of the entire thing, and it could be cheaper to just replace it. Um, but yeah, I mean, places where they tend to wear out, where you need to really look at it, is where um, if there's uh, damage around the agol, where it connects to the uh, the membuchi, or when the futon, if it's a really cheap burger and the inside of the futon's gone all soft. Um, that's why I'm always talking about these sort of cheap burger sets you can pick up online for like $300 um, that are just junk because that's going to happen to them. The actual futon after a while is just like the the pattern's going to give way and it's not going to stop. It's not going to protect properly on the top of the head here. Um, but, you know, I don't need to tell you guys that like, you all shop at Kendo Star. So <laughs> anyway, um, the <laughs> you all have that problem. But, um, you know, if, if, if it's a club burger or something and like the futon's all soft and it's not really protecting properly, then, yeah, that's when you need to replace it. I mean, a, 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 anything really that when it's not going to be a, a feasible repair and it results in the burger not protecting you properly, then it needs to be replaced. The, the Borg is there to replace, uh, to, to protect you. It's there to be protective. And if it's not doing that, then it's, it, it, it needs to be replaced. Uh, next one, this is a bit of a longer question. Regarding your response regarding instructors giving feedback, I've been struggling lately as all the feedback I've been getting from Sensei and Senpai have been along the lines of you're doing well, keep practicing, nice kote, uh, which is nice but incredibly unhelpful uh, for me to figure out what to work on next. I've tried asking for more critical feedback but I'm getting more of the same. Uh, for context, I'm second down so there's plenty for me to be working on uh, but also when I point this out, they say that I could pass third down, right, third down right now but surely there must be things that I still have to work on. Uh, I don't want to sound ungrateful for the positive feedback but I'm just looking for tangible things to work on rather than trying to come up with them all on my own uh, and I'm hoping it's not because I'm not a good student because I saw people getting unsolicited feedback but I don't seem to get feedback when act without actually pursuing it uh, not sure how I should go about getting tangible critical feedback any advice so yeah um, it's hard to say because I don't know you and I don't know what's going on in your dojo but look um, here's the thing uh, I would like you to be less reliant on your instructors for for uh, for instruction, uh, for want of a better term. Um, your sensei, your senpai, they're there to give you, you know, at your level now, second dan to third dan to fourth dan. Um, basically, going forward now, you're on your path as much as any as, as anything. So you you you've got to figure it out now. Um, probably the thing is is yeah. Your, your your seniors are, are giving you this sort of feedback. Oh yeah, nice, you're doing well. Yeah, you could easily get through third down. That's probably the case. They're probably I'm sure it's, I'm sure they're being honest with you. I'm sure they're being earnest. Um, and they're probably there's probably not glaring things um, that are like oh that really needs to fix now, um, which you tend to get up to about the first and second down level. <laughs> uh, but sort of going towards third down, fourth down, it's much more. 
um, subtle things that even if your senior say, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that, it's something you've got to figure out for yourself. Um, so what you need to really do is you really need to take that on yourself to make those steps. Make sure you're doing enough mitori geiko. Make sure you're doing enough um, what what you call hand say the reflection on your practice or how did practice go today mm, well that was quite good and that could have been better and i'd prefer it if it was like this you know you ha you really have to do that you really have to take that on and um, so even if you're not getting that guidance from your seniors that you're able able to still improve now i totally relate to you i got this for a long time in fact for the majority of my time living in japan that's all i ever got oh you're really good oh that's brilliant yeah you're the best foreigner i've ever seen yeah <laughs> that's pretty much all i was ever told um i rarely got specific feedback so i had to figure it out for myself um and that's um and i think that's you know it's not just because I was a foreigner over there, part of it was that, but it's also because as an adult doing kendo in Japan, that's how you're expected to progress. Um, you don't get a lot of direct feedback or teaching from, um, from your sort of senseis and stuff as an adult. Um, so yeah, you're kind of expected to take it upon yourself and I'm, I'm sure you can do it. Um, so yeah. Do that. <laughs> uh, what are some creative drills you use for Kihon and Waza practice? Um, I don't use many creative drills or uh, for Kihon or Waza practice. I use traditional drills um, because I think they're tried and tested and they work the best. Um, I'm, I'm not one that sort of, I, I'm always looking to figure out better teaching methods and how I can be uh, um, make better explanations and stuff. But I don't think I'd do anything that would be considered that creative. That being said, I've got some video content coming soon about, um, kind of uh, practice methods and stuff. So maybe you'll find something there that's useful. Uh, last one, this is, a, uh, this is more of a personal question. As an alum, um, I'm, I, I've been ostracized by some of the other alumni of my college kendo club because I supported the students in cutting down on sensei visits since the club size uh, and finances are limited. Uh, they claimed I was trying to get the sensei fired, which was not my intent. Based on your experience with sensei in Japan, is this a normal response for a Japanese sensei? Uh, that they would think that they're being fired or that they wouldn't understand that college students can't support so many visits. I'm foreign to a lot of Japanese etiquette, so it's not clear to me what's real and what's exaggerated. Um, I was taught that Japanese sensei are to be treated like gods, but I'm not sure if that's true, that the sensei would take offense to simple requests, um, or if we accidentally ate or drank, drank before them at a meal or didn't carry their borg for them. Okay, so this is, this is quite a difficult question, because um, I don't understand the situation in your, uh, in your club. <laughs> um, when you say that you're cutting down on the visits of Japanese sensei, I mean, are you, I assume that means you're somehow paying for these visits financially. Um, and it depends on what do you mean. Well, I, I, especially I don't understand what he says to trying to get the sensei fired. So is this a situation where you've got sensei is coming every week or every practice and you're paying for them to come in some way um that's a very unusual situation that sort of thing doesn't happen in japan except at um sort of schools or university where the sensei is employed by the institution to be there as a kendo teacher but the students aren't or the, the you know aren't having to stump up the cash for it and um, so i can't relate to this situation because i've never experienced it um if a, 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 I, i've never sort of experienced it a teacher that comes on a regular basis and then receives some sort of monetary uh, reimbursement from the club they're specifically teaching in this way, like in, in the way that you, you, you're saying, like a, a teacher coming to teach at your, your, your college club or your, uh, your yeah, your college club, um, and, it's, uh, and it's paying for them. And now you, you, the, the club is now struggling with finances and can't afford to do that, and you're being um, ostracised, in your words. Um, <laughs> for suggesting cutting down on those visits. I mean, it seems to me like, I think the best thing to do is like, uh, I mean, I just, I, 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 I can't imagine this sort of thing happening in Japan. Um, so if, if this is a Japanese sensei, I mean, I think the thing to do is you need to talk to the sensei and say, look, sensei, um, you know, obviously we really appreciate you coming and teaching us and stuff, um, but it, it, it's actually costing us X and we've only got Y. Um, so something needs to be sort of worked out in between here because we really value your, in your input and we really want you to continue guiding us. Um, but, we're, you know, it, 
the maths don't work. <laughs> um, and in terms of uh, Japanese sense, they've been treated like gods. Um, right. <laughs> No, they shouldn't be treated like gods, and they're not treated like gods in Japan. It's just the they have a, very, a different social um, structure in Japan, where uh, people of a sort of it's kind of a hierarchical system, and it's not just within kendo; it's in everyday life. Um, but kendo sensei are obviously at the top of that hierarchy when you're in a sort of kendo situation. So yeah, people carry the stuff for them. People treat them like uh, VIPs, I'd say, rather than gods. Um, and yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't start eating or drinking before them, and that's that's very much part of Japanese culture. However, if you're not in Japan, right? If you're not in Japan, and you haven't said where you are, but if you're not in Japan, um, and you've got a Japanese sensei coming there, then I'm sure they understand to a large extent that, um, especially if they've been in your country for a while, um, that people in your country don't have that as a sort of social norm. Um, and I think they would forgive you. And I think they'd be very harsh not to forgive you for doing something simple like, um, you know, uh, accidentally eating or drink before them at a meal or not carrying the burger and stuff like that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and here's the other thing, to be honest, and this is what I, this is something that I am quite keen on is, um, if you, if you don't, do that for the non-Japanese sensei, then you shouldn't do it for the Japanese sensei. Um, you should you should treat them the same. Um, now, what I'm, by by that I mean um, to qualify that, you know, um, it would be odd to carry one sensei's bogo and not another based on their nationality or race, right? So I'd carry I'd carry both the bogos if it was me. <laughs> uh, if if we're going down the cat carrying the bogo route, if you say you see what I'm saying. Um, okay, uh, almost there. I've got a couple, uh, cu couple to go. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, are there any literature? So we're we're on to new questions now. Um, those that last chunk was from the same person, so I hope I hope they sort of all kind of come towards some sort of answer to your question. Um, is there any literature that contains essays or writings from eighth to tenth dan kenshi's that you've come across? I've tried to search search for it, but it looks like there's none in English. Uh, there's not a lot in English, to be honest. There's very, very little uh, kendo literature in English. But um, I suggest you get to kendobook.com. I think it is. If you go to kenshi247.net, kenshi247.net. Um, that's uh, that's a brilliant website for a start. There's loads of amazing um, writings from uh, tenth dan's and loads of Kendo historical writings in English there, first of all. Also, um, there's the very popular, um, I guess it's a book. Well, it is a book. Um, George from Kenshi247 translated The Kendo Reader. Um, so, yeah, go and check that out as well. I think it's for sale on kendobook.com. Um, and it's definitely worth a purchase. It's definitely a great book. Um, and, and I think it's right up your street if that's what you're looking for. Uh, hello, I have a question. Um, when I sit in, okay, so this one's from the Kendo Show Early Access group, by the way. If you're not in the group, get in the group. There's a link in the description. Say it every week, every week, every vi video. Um, <laughs> so more than every week. So, uh, so get in the group if you're not in there. It's free to join. It's a great place to post your questions. Um, I have a question. When I sit in Cezanne, I have a pain on my left, I have a pain on my left foot. Uh, I did twist my ankle. Um, is there a, is there a different way I can sit in Cezanne? Um, can anyone help? So first thing you need to do is speak to your teacher at your club. Ask, say, look, I've got pain here. How can I sit um, respectively um, in Cesar or not in Cesar? How can I sit that would still be okay? Uh, if you were in my club, I'd tell you to sit sort of like either cross-legged or like um, com sit comfortably. Um, I wouldn't want you going through pain in order to just to go through the motions of sitting in Cesar. Um the thing about Cesar is it does take some getting used to, especially for us that aren't that used to doing it. Cesar is another thing that's culturally different. It's something that's actually culturally um, sort of, well, yeah, I mean, it's part of Japanese culture. People sit in Cesar quite a lot over there um, and they're more used to it than we are outside of Japan. So um, it does take a, quite a bit of getting used to. Um, if you get in serious pain, though, obviously I can't give you any information about that. I'm no medical professional. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you need to see someone to make sure that um, you haven't done yourself any damage. Okay, so last question is about a, uh, a door of mine. Um, it was a screenshot that was taken from the last video. Uh, not the last video, actually. It was like one of last week's videos, which was against the other backdrop. And I'm just against plain white at the minute, but that's uh, a 
that's just how it is. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, one of you kind of pointed out the uh, uh, one of the door in the background and was asking me to talk a little bit about it, give a little bit more um, information about it. So here it is. Um, this this one. Can you see it? Let me back a bit. There we go. Um, so this is this is my favourite door. Um, it's my most well used door, as you can see. It's very. It's a little bit. Um, bruised and battered, <laughs> uh, which I think gives it more of, more of a um, kind of uh, endearing quality. Um, I love this door. This is my, my favourite one. Um, and this is basically, um, you're asking about what, what kind of door is it? It's a Kiji door. It's a, a plain Kiji door. Um, and we, we can offer these. Um, I, think, I think they're on the website as an option, but if they're not, just, just hit me up. We can certainly sort one out for you if you want one. Um, it's basically, um, it's a bamboo door, as you can see and it's covered with rawhide, okay? So when they actually make an urushi door, a black um, lacquered door, they make it just like this, and then they lacquer over the top. So it's basically a door that before it's had the, the lacquer applied. Um, so as you can see, as you use it, it does pick up uh, battle scars, as I like to think of them. Um, so it, it, it does kind of, it, you see how it's darkened here as well? This is, this is from the, uh, the dye from my kendogi. Yeah, from when I've been wearing it, this is where my, my elbow's rubbed against it. Um, the same on this side. So it's picked up dye from my Kendogi and stuff, and, you know, it's, it, it's, been, it's been hit a lot. Um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, uh, I just love it. I love it. And um, I, I did want to talk about it because um, it is a really special door to me. This was a gift from my, uh, my father-in-law um, when I first ever went over to Japan. Uh, actually, before my wife and I were married, um, when I, I sort of first went over there to kind of introduce myself to the family. <laughs> um, and uh, it, was, it was my birthday as it happened while I was over there. And, um, yeah, my, my father-in-law um, very kindly presented me with this, this beautiful doll. Um, he had one just like it. Um, and I said how much I thought they were cool. I really liked them. And, uh, yeah, he, um, he, he had this one sort of made up for me and uh and presented me with it and it's been a it's a be, been a real uh treasure to me ever since um i, I use it a lot in as on my time as a uh, a national team player um i don't use it as much now just because it is quite uh battered uh, and i don't want it to get any more sort of damaged and stuff i don't i i just i just love it so much i, I kind of i don't want it to get I don't want it to get hurt in a way. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it's still got plenty of life in it, but like I, I only I only bring it out now for very very special occasions. Um, so yeah, it's uh, as you can see, like I say, it's, it, it's a little bit beat up, but like I, I actually quite like that. I think it, I think it adds a really nice kind of quality. Really gives it character. So yeah, so that's 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 that. Okay, so uh, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all that sort of thing, and leave me a comment down below what you'd like me to rant about next time. Um, most importantly, don't forget to do your shopping at kendostar.com. I think I, I've said this in the last video, maybe the one before that as well. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, kendostar.com, that's the website that I run, of course. Um, it's the amazing, uh, wonderful, best Kendo equipment supplier in the entire world, if you ask me. Uh, of course, I would say that, but um, most people tend to agree with me. Uh, get over to kendostar.com, check out what we've got. We've got some amazing deals on Borgu, Uniforms, Shinai. We've always got deals on, so go and have a look. Um, not only is it, I think it's great uh, value, but it's amazing quality, and it's particularly uh, designed for the international community as well. Okay, so uh, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.